Okay, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for um, participating in this uh, program on psychology and the law, uh, racial disparities and legal outcomes. Uh, my name is Tom Dunn. I'm a Tufts grad from 2000. I'm a partner at Pierce Atwood in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, um, and the president of the Tufts Lawyers Association, who's the sponsor of this event. Um, the Tufts Lawyers Association is a nonprofit um, organization. Um, you are a member if you're an attorney um, and you went to Tufts or you went to law school. Um, and uh, there's no membership fee. So if you want to learn more about the TLA, just search uh, Tufts Lawyers Association on LinkedIn or at Tufts Lawyers on Instagram and Twitter. Um, like all organizations right now, um, our members and our board want to listen, learn, um, and discuss with its member issues of equality, uh, social justice, um, police violence, and um, related issues. You know, while the phrase justice is blind is a common phrase, we know that unfortunately uh, that's not the case in all situ situations. But we can strive to be better and enact uh, change to make difference as lawyers, law students, um, judges, and citizens. It was in that spirit that we put this panel together, um, and I'm super excited to uh, work on it um, uh, with our speakers. Our speakers are Professor uh, Samuel Summers and Ju Judge Timothy Lewis. Um, Professor uh, Samuel Summers is going to uh, give his remarks about um, his research on these topics. And then following his remarks, Judge Lewis is going to, to give uh, his remarks about equality and, and, and his call on, on how we can take steps uh, to make a difference. We um, are then going to have about 10 or 15 minutes of uh, questions and answers. And I invite you all to Submit your questions. We'll be looking at them uh, during the remarks and we'll be um, uh, fielding them at the end of the program. Uh, Professor Sam Summers is the chair of the psychology department at Tufts. Uh, his research focuses on race and social perception, uh, judgment and interaction, and the intersection of psychology and the law. Uh, he's a student favorite, receiving a number of awards from the student body. Um, his, uh, I was at my house watching John Oliver's show a few weeks ago and was surprised to hear research that I knew sounded just like uh, Professor Summers and I realized then a few minutes later his face was on the screen talking. Um, so we are really excited to have him talk about his research and I'll introduce uh, Judge Lewis after uh, Professor Summers has finished. So Professor Summers, take it away. Thank you. Uh, Tom, I appreciate that introduction. It's, it's nice to be here. Uh, I am actually here, like I am literally on campus in Medford, uh, in my office. So I'm sure the first question many of you have is, what is that like? And it's great. Uh, I just walked across campus and took my weekly COVID test and saw students out on a beautiful day, socially distancing, wearing their masks. It looks like our campus again. I mean, in a pandemic, yes, but uh, it wasn't the ghost town it has been. It's it's nice to be here. Uh, I, I appreciate the uh, association putting on this event. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from Judge Lewis in the conversation. I'm also enjoying the attendees list because I can see a bunch of names that have been on my course rosters in the past and former advisees, and it's nice to see all of you here, uh, at least virtually. I'm going to share my screen, uh, which in theory is something I can do quickly now because it's sort of a part of the daily uh, experience of being a college professor. There we are. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, some of the research that psychologists have done on this question of racial disparities in, in legal outcomes. It is uh, a set of issues that I have studied in my research for uh, a long time. Um, it is a set of issues that feels just as if not more pressing and um, urgent today in this summer and fall uh, as it has in the in the years that I've studied it, but these issues of of racial disparities in legal outcomes are are not new. Um, and so, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about how we, as behavioral scientists, as psychologists, study these issues in our research. Um, the question here 
that uh, we'll discuss or the questions that we'll discuss will be will be multiple. I'll actually talk about uh, a variety uh, of issues here in my in my brief amount of time. We could spend an entire semester, as some of you in this webinar have done with me before, talking about issues related to policing and charging and trial outcomes and a variety of other components of the legal and criminal justice system. Um, I'm going to show you some photos. I made the executive decision not, not to update these photos, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. I'm going to show you some photos of people you might recognize. Um, that'd be Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, and Eric Garner. Uh, I put the slideshow together a few years ago, clearly, when I selected those photos. Um, I could have updated those photos, and I thought about doing that with faces like Ahmed Arbery, and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd uh, and, and others. And I ultimately decided, no, I wanted to show these to remind us that this is an issue that has been going on for, well, not just a few years, for generations in this, uh, in this country, but to, to suggest that even in its heightened level of awareness, when we talk about racially charged policing, when we talk about uh, the, the deaths of, of Black Americans, of, of Hispanic Americans at the hands of the police or at the hands of individuals who are taking justice into their own hands. These are not new developments. Um, we now have cell phone cameras and cell phone uh, videos to, to corroborate what for some people in our society was something they only heard about but didn't actually have to confront. And now we confront it regularly uh, on social media, in the news, and uh, in all of its distressing um, full screened uh, nature. So will I be able to stand up here? Well sit here today and tell you that these men, their race is what definitively caused their death and the way that the system responded to them. Um, well, that's not how behavioral science works. It's a field that draws conclusions based on aggregated data and probabilistic inference. And, and that is one of the major gulfs that exists between actually what people like me, psychologists, researchers do, and what many of you who are legal professionals do. Um, it's that the system wants to adjudicate one particular incident or case. And in science, we're trying to offer more generalized conclusions regarding tendency and likelihood. But I think what you'll see is that the data are pretty compelling that illustrate at an aggregate level in the controlled studies and the archival analyses of actual outcomes that researchers like me and, and many, many others have done, uh, that there's a very clear link between race and the way an individual in our society is treated in their interactions with police, in their interactions with uh, the, the, the courts, um, and at all stages before and after that process. And so I'm going to talk about some research that I have done, but also in large part focus on the research of some of the other luminaries in the field that they've done that, that some people on this webinar have heard about before in my psychology and law seminar that I teach here uh, at Tufts. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about some research published by this woman, Jennifer Eberhardt, who's a professor uh, at Stanford. Uh, Professor Eberhardt is someone who you might have heard about or seen this summer, in fact. She gave a pretty well-received TED Talk on Zoom, because that's how this happens these days. Uh, I believe she, she had a, an appearance on one of Oprah's uh, programs these days, however it is that Oprah is streaming her content for uh, the, the public. Uh, Professor Eberhardt is, as you'll see in this headline, the, the recipient of a MacArthur grant. She is a literal genius in the eyes of the MacArthur Foundation. And her work, as you'll see, is incredibly important and powerful and, and clearly very well deserving, deserving of that um, title. And so I wanted to start by looking at a couple of studies that uh, Jennifer Everhart and her colleagues at Stanford have conducted to illustrate at least the first portion of what we're talking about here, questions of policing and, and racial disparity. And so what Everhart and her colleagues have done in the series of studies is examine the relationship that exists between how we as human beings think about race and how we as human beings think about crime. Her argument is fairly straightforward, that there is a bi-directional association between perceptions of race and perceptions of crime. That our ideas and expectations and assumptions about race and our ideas and expectations and assumptions about crime are linked and that the causality is bi-directional. It goes in both directions. So our perceptions and thoughts about race influence our perceptions of crime. Our perceptions and thoughts about crime influence our thoughts about race. How has she studied this? Well, 
Uh, like, like me and like many psychologists, Professor Eberhardt conducts experiments. So she does studies in a controlled setting for the most part where she can vary aspects of a scenario, manipulate variables um, to conduct, uh, to investigate the questions she's interested in. So let me tell you about her first study in this paper from 2004. It's a study that used college students, white male students from Berkeley and Stanford as participants. So that's an important issue to bear in mind and we'll revisit that in a moment. What she did in this study uh, is present subliminally participants with a face, either a white face, face of a white male, or a face of a black male. And these are presented subliminally, subliminally. So it happens so quickly that you know you've seen something, but you don't know exactly what it is that you have seen. So you're not consciously aware that you've seen a face. You just know that a blur just appeared on the screen. And then your job as participants in this study is to recognize degraded images as they come into focus. So you see something that looks like this on your left of the screen to start, it's pretty fuzzy. It comes in over time, over a series of frames to become a revolver, to become a weapon. And you're shown several, of item, several items like these. Some of them are related to crime, like this one. Some of them are neutral and not related to crime. Now, for those of you who are data inclined, empirically inclined, you'll be excited to see this bar graph. For those of you who are not, don't worry, I'll give you the quick Cliff's Notes version of what we're seeing here. What we're seeing here are participants' responses on the y-axis in terms of frame number, in other words, how many frames of that image they had to see in order to determine what the object actually was. And if you look at your bars on the far left, the two bars on your far left over the white prime label, what you're seeing there is that when these participants had previously been shown a subliminal image of a white face, they are, if anything, somewhat slower. It takes longer for them to identify crime-related objects versus crime-irrelevant objects. The dark bar is larger than, higher than the white bar. If you go all the way to the two bars on the right, you'll see the exact opposite pattern over the black prime label, suggesting that in this instance, participants were far quicker to identify crime-relevant objects than crime-irrelevant objects, or at least statistically significantly quicker to do so, leading Eberhardt and colleagues to, here's your Cliff's Notes version of that graph, act, the conclusion that activating thoughts related to black activates these participants' thoughts related to crime. Subliminally even, outside of conscious awareness, making people think about, in this case, an African-American male's face, made these white participants in this study more likely to recognize or were more likely to think about crime in the sense that they were quicker to recognize these crime related objects. It's a pretty creative method to study something that we're still concerned about and talking about today in the real world. And, and in a follow up study, what Eberhardt and colleagues do is basically turn this around and do it in the opposite order, in the opposite direction. This is, here's what I mean by that. In this study, also one with white male college students, an aspect of it to which we will return. In this study, they prime participants subliminally with something related to crime, an, an item, an object related to crime, or they don't give a prime at all. So here there's a subliminal image flash for some participants of a weapon or something crime related, or there's no prime whatsoever. In this case, what they ask participants to do, the task they have to perform on, is known as a dot probe task. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like. So here's what a dot probe task looks like if you're a participant. You're asked to sit in front of a screen and fixate on this cross. And then at some point, the cross goes away and two faces appear. And your job is as follows. A dot is going to be on the screen, and I want you to push one button or the other to tell me which side of the screen the dot is on, and then it happens. And in this case, you say, well, it's on the left side of the screen. You push with your left hand. They do this over and over again. And the idea is that if the dot is behind the face I'm already looking at, if I'm already looking at the black face in this instance, I'm going to be quicker on this trial to, to recognize that dot and to respond to it than I will in this trial, where if I'm looking at the white face, I have to move my visual field. It doesn't feel like it's all that far, but I have to go all the way to the left side to see it. And indeed, that's what Eberhardt and colleagues find. Again, here's the graph if you want to see it in all of its, in all of its glory. If, if we look at the right bars here, the crime prime condition, white participants who had been shown previously an image of crime, subliminally, something related to crime, are quicker to recognize the face when it's right behind the black face 
sorry, the dot, when it's right behind the black face, as opposed to when it's right behind the white face. It suggests that the participants who see these primes related to crime are focusing on looking at the black face more so than you see on the other side on the left side of this graph when there's no prime at all. Something about, in this instance, activating thoughts related to crime leads these participants to pay more attention to the black face than the white face. That's the conclusion Eberhardt and her colleagues offer. Activating thoughts related to crime leads to more attention paid to black faces. Okay, so these are just white students at Stanford and Berkeley. If we found results like that among police officers or among the general public, that would be concerning that just talking about crime makes people pay more attention to people of a particular racial group. Um, and indeed in follow-up studies, that's what researchers have, have found. So there are many questions we might ask about race and policing, and there's still open questions in the research literature. Would we find similar results for civilians versus police? Uh, for that matter, what about across police officer race? The results do, of, of these data do seem to suggest indeed that you find the same kinds of results with police officers. In fact, Eberhardt and her colleagues run the exact same studies with police officers and find very similar results. We could spend an entire month of a seminar talking about these data with regard to race and policing. Um, there are follow-up studies that Joshua Carell and Ab uh, Ashby Plant and Keith Payne and other researchers have conducted that show there's a behavioral component here as well. If you show people photographs of white or black individuals holding either weapons or items that look like weapons but aren't and ask them to recognize whether this person is a threat or not, similar biases emerge among civilians as well as among police officers. I do want to make sure we have time to talk about what goes on in the courtroom as well. Um, this is actually something that I study in my research, questions of race in the courtroom. Um, one set of issues that we actually don't have a lot of data about is what, or what happens before you even get to the point of a trial, what happens with charging decisions, for example. Um, this is a big question. There's a tremendous amount of uh, subjectivity involved in the charges that are brought against an individual in, in many cases. Those can be questions of degree and, and, and intent and, and, and whether to even proceed with charges to begin with, whether to charge someone as a juvenile versus adult. Um, those are questions that psychologists and behavioral scientists are addressing in their research. And, and this one, maybe not to the degree that, has, that should be to, to date. Um, attorneys and judges during jury selection. Uh, this is something I've studied in some of my research, the, the question of, of to what degree are um, the, the, the race of prospective jurors influential in the, the peremptory challenges that attorneys use, and they're not supposed to be, according to the Supreme Court, but to what degree are they influential, these demographics like gender and race, and what can we do about it, if anything, in the system? And of course, there are also questions about jury deliberations. Um, and yes, as Tom mentioned, when John Oliver was kind enough to put my face on the screen for a couple of moments not long ago, it was this research um, that, that he was talking about. And so I thought I would wrap up by showing you some of my work in, in, in at least one study that looks at these issues of, uh, of race and jury deliberation specifically. Um, so this is a study in which we recruited for uh, our, our experiment, not college students, and no disrespect to college students, but they're not always entirely representative of humanity at large. I think we can all attest to that from personal experience. We, in this case, recruited our participants from an actual jury pool. This was a study that was actually run uh, in Michigan when I was uh, at the University of Michigan. And what we did in this study was assembled six-person juries, mock juries, who all watched a video of the same trial. We had them complete a written voir dire jury selection questionnaire. They all watched the same trial video with a black defendant. Um, it was a sexual assault case in this trial, uh, in, in this particular study. And then what we did was we recorded their jury deliberations. We, we told them to discuss the case and reach a unanimous verdict. We read them um, uh, jury instructions and had them do this. What we were particularly interested in in this study was the question of the racial composition of these juries. So in this experiment, half of our mock juries, they're mock juries making decisions that don't have real weight recognizing that ahead of time here. But what we had uh, it was half of our mock juries were all white, so six white jurors on the, on the panel. And the other half of our jurors were racially diverse. And in this study, in this particular experiment, we controlled that as, as four white and two black jurors on the panel. You might ask, why not do three and three? Why not do all black juries? Why not look at other racial demographics? 
all great questions. As researchers, we make a series of choices, some practical, some theoretical, and we had to sort of pick a, pick a lane to jump into for this study, and that's how we, we did this study. A lot of questions to examine in this study, a lot of data. We have videotaped deliberations. They're really interesting to look through. I just want to show you a couple quick findings. One of them here is a finding regarding what our individual jurors were thinking about the case. Again, remember, a trial with a Black defendant before deliberations even began. We did have them complete a completely anonymous one question survey, essentially. What's your vote right now, guilty or not guilty? And what you'll see, and perhaps some of you might have predicted this, is that our Black jurors, who you see represented in the yellow bars here, were less likely to think the Black defendant was guilty or less likely to be voting guilty in this trial than were our white jurors, who are represented by the blue and the red bars. But beyond that first conclusion you might draw, you might also note some sense that the red and the blue bars are different. The blue bars being our white jurors who are on racially diverse juries, the red bars being our white jurors who are on all white juries. In this study, over and over again, we find that our white jurors performed, behaved very differently depending on whether they were on a homogenous all-white jury or whether they were part of a racially diverse jury. And keep in mind, at this point, the juries hadn't even begun deliberations. So any effects of the jury composition have nothing to do with what was exchanged in terms of the discussion and the information during deliberations. It's just sort of knowing you're part of a diverse or, or a, a homogeneous group. Um, we also looked at just the breadth of deliberation topics covered in these juries' discussion of the case. And you'll see that our racially diverse juries actually cover a broader range of topics, just facts of the case. Uh, the yellow and blue bars are at the level or higher than the bars for our, our, our red bars here from the white jurors and the all white juries. Our racially diverse juries covered a wider range of information. And in a finding that I always thought was particularly compelling, they made fewer factual errors. There were fewer errors made per jury, just talking about the facts of the case in the racially diverse juries than in the all white juries. And when factual errors came up during deliberations on the diverse juries, often someone corrected it. In the all white juries, that didn't happen as often. The, the short version of the study or the conclusions of this study uh, are as follows. We found at least for this particular trial and this particular mock jury scenario, that diverse juries discussed more information and they did so more accurately than did the all white juries. Does that result generalized to all cases? What about with a white defendant? What about other racial demographics? We don't know. But in this study, at least, our diverse juries discussed a wider range of information and they did so more accurately. They were more likely to have conversations about race and racism, substantive conversations. It doesn't mean they always agreed, they did not. But when those controversial issues about race came up in all white juries, there was almost always a effort to minimize it and to, to move on and to have a conversation about something else other than race. I would propose that these data, though imperfect because all studies are, suggest that jury representativeness is about more than morality and constitutionality and even more than the perceived legitimacy of the system. I would argue that at least among these data, the diverse juries in this study are better at their task. Better is a tough concept for juries and judges in making decisions about a case. There is no gold standard. We don't know what the quote unquote right verdict is in a particular case, but I would certainly propose that most of us would agree that having more thorough, more accurate, and more wide ranging discussions in a jury are all good things, are all, are all fair descriptions of, of better uh, for, for juries. And as, as Many have argued more articulately than I can, as, as Justice Thurgood Marshall once noted, that when you deprive from the jury room jurors of a particular background, you are depriving that jury of certain perspectives. And beyond that, it looks like from this study, certain processes that you can see playing out when you have more representative and diverse juries. So with that, I will end my prepared remarks and uh, stop sharing my screen and turn things back over to Tom uh, so that we can continue to have this conversation and, and hear uh, what, what Judge Lewis has to say, which I'm very excited about.
Sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, th thank you, Professor Summers, for, for that excellent um, sur summary. I, I can't wait to, uh, to learn more as you do research in the coming years. Um, Judge uh, Lewis is a 1976 graduate of uh, Tufts. Um, he is the co-chair of the uh, Alternative Dispute Resolution uh, practice at Schneider Harrison in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, throughout his career, uh, which is a very uh, impressive and, 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 uh, and diverse career, he's been a passionate leader on diversity, inclusion, and equality issues. Um, his career includes service as the Assistant U.S. Attorney in Pennsylvania, serving as a judge on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Pennsylvania and on the Third Circuit. Um, at the time of each of his appointments to that, the federal bench, he was the youngest um, appointee um, at the time. Um, I have been very impressed um, with talking with Judge Lewis um, about a variety of topics, but his dedication and focus on judicial independence and civil discourse amongst our branches of government, um, particularly where we are now, um, it ha has been really um, enlightening for me. And so I, I look forward to his remarks um, and, um, and please continue to send the questions. Judge Lewis, um, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, it's, uh, it's really an honor to be with you all today. Um, I bring you greetings from my hometown of Pittsburgh. Um, and I especially am grateful for the opportunity to share this opportunity with or this um, presentation with Professor Summers, whose work has been important and defining. Um, I'm going to talk to you in general about some things and some thoughts that I have about where we are and why we are here uh, in addressing this topic. And I hope to also share with you some ideas for how we might go forward. But I'm, I'm going to begin uh, where Tom just left off, really. I, I was at Tufts from 1972 through 1976. Um, in 1975, I participated in a demonstration against the violence that at that time was visited upon black students who were trying to peacefully integrate South Boston High School. And Gil Scott Heron, the great artist, uh, took notice of that violence in a poem that he wrote in which he said, as Boston becomes Birmingham, becomes Little Rock, becomes Selma, becomes yesterday, all over again. Today, Gil Scott Heron would not have enough breath to list all of the cities and regions and all of the incidents that are caught on video throughout our country that have revealed more of the truth about American racism. Uh, he might have found some hope uh, in the recognition that this has sparked a deeper awareness of the urgency. Always it's about the urgency of our national plight. Um, and as has always been the case, at least for me, and I believe for most of us, we will do as well as we choose to do in this moment. This truly is a critical moment in our nation's history, and it's an important time to have this discussion. First and foremost, and especially as fellow toilers in the vineyard of the law, it is important that you understand that. It's up to you. We will do as well as we choose to do. It's up to each of us, and it's in our hands. So let me just take a moment to put the issue squarely on the table in language that we can't hide from. For me, when we talk about uh, psychological perspectives on racial disparities and legal outcomes, we're talking about systemic racism. We're talking about the vestiges of slavery and the deeply embedded racist history of our country. We are talking about a racial caste system that is manifested in conscious and unconscious biases and um, unconscious biases, it's far too comfortable a term for me. Um, these biases though that directly impact the political, the social and the economic welfare of people of color and particularly black people in this country. 50 years ago, the signs read, I am somebody. Six years ago, they read, hands up, don't shoot. 
Today, they read, in effect, my life matters. In spite of our progress and 50 years apart, we are still in the streets with the same desperate plea simply to be respected and treated as a human being and as a citizen, even when being arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced. I've had a role in each of those stages throughout my professional life from every angle except actually being arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced. And I've seen enough to know that these disparities are pervasive, they are real, they are systemic, and they are lethal. They don't just too often kill presumptively innocent and actually innocent people because of race. They also kill any semblance of faith in our justice system. These disparities, uh, as far as I'm concerned, reflect the very worst of our collective character, which again, is all the more reason that we need to talk about them. Because until we're willing to confront the truth about all of this, there's really no hope that any of it is gonna change. And the truth is that particularly um, uh, when it comes to um, race, we are, we are all practically born with a, a prism that distorts our vision, distorts our vision of ourselves and of each other. And that's why on matters of race, I've learned that it is wrong to automatically question the hearts or the sincerity of those with whom I may vehemently disagree. Racism plagues everything it touches and it touches everything. I've confronted the insanity of race as a child, surrounded by National Guard troops with fixed bayonets. I've confronted the insanity of race as a federal judge on the United States District Court and on the United States Court of Appeals. I have fought racial injustice in the streets and I've fought it in corporate boardrooms with my heart and with my mind. And I have learned through all of that that our most common failure is our inability to see ourselves in everyone we encounter and to see everyone we encounter in ourselves. That to me is the root of systemic racism in our justice system and beyond. It begins and ends with each of us and with our capacity to see and to appreciate the dignity that we must accord one another no matter who we are and no matter how different we might be. Every judge brings the experiences that form their character and their identity with them to the bench. The same is true with police officers, same is true with jurors, with prosecutors, with legislators, just to name a few. And as lawyers, we all bring our values and our intellect to whatever it is that we do. We also bring our prejudices and our ignorance. But ideally, we evolve, we, we learn from each other, and I hope that we never stop learning. When I was young, uh, I read uh, James Baldwin's brilliant work, The Fire Next Time, which I'm rereading now. I commend all of you to reread again, if you have already done so, or to read for the first time. He opens with a letter to his nephew written in 1963 in observance of the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And this letter captures the essence of systemic racism and the brutal harm that it has inflicted upon black people, of course, but perhaps especially upon the psyches of white people since before our nation's founding. These are both the cause and the effect of racial disparities in outcomes. He begins by telling the boy about his grandfather, Baldwin's father. He writes, he is dead. He never saw you and he had a terrible life. He was defeated long before he died because at the bottom of his heart, he really believed what white people said about him. You can only be destroyed by believing that you really are what the white world calls you. And I tell you this because I love you and please don't ever forget it. And then Baldwin continues, he says, I know that the world has done to my brother what it has done and how he has narrowly survived it. And I know that my countrymen have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives and do not even know it and do not want to know it. But it is their innocence which constitutes the crime. This innocent country 
set you down in a ghetto in which, in fact, it intended that you should perish. Let me spell out precisely what I mean by that, for the heart of the matter is here and the root of my dispute with my country. You were born where you were born and faced the future you faced because you were black and for no other reason. The limits of your ambition were thus set forever. You were born into a society that spelled out with brutal clarity and in as many ways as possible that you were a worthless human being. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity. I know your countrymen do not agree, and I hear them saying, you exaggerate. They do not know Harlem, and I do. They are, in effect, still trapped in a history which even they do not understand, and until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. They have had to believe for many years and for innumerable reasons that black men are inferior to white men. Many of them know better, but as you will discover, people find it very difficult to act on what they know. To act is to be committed, and to be committed is to be in danger. In this case, the danger in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their own identity. If the word integration means anything, here is what it means, that we, with love, shall force our brothers to see themselves as they are, to cease fleeing from reality and begin to change it. For this is your home, and we can make America what America must become. You know and I know that this country is celebrating 100 years of freedom, 100 years too soon. We cannot be free until they are free. Now, 44 years after Baldwin wrote that, in 2007, the Chief Justice of the United States, a man of immense decency whom I have met and whom I respect, indulged the willful blindness that Baldwin described. In striking down two school districts' efforts to achieve diversity through race-conscious measures, he invoked the remarkably ahistorical phrase quote, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race, close quote. I thought that this statement was shockingly devoid of the context required to address such an important issue. And in my view, when he wrote those words, Chief Justice Roberts was conveniently excising the history and the culture of this nation from present day reality. A few years later in Shelby County versus Holder, he wrote that the preclearance provisions requiring federal approval for any change in voting laws in states that had a long history of disenfranchising black voters were quote, outdated, close quote. He added that our country has changed and legislation that remedies racial discrimination must quote, speak to current conditions, close quote. He concluded that the problems the Voting Rights Act was designed to correct no longer existed. Now, we have certainly learned a lot more about current conditions since then. We are learning even more about current conditions literally today, literally today. Efforts to disenfranchise black voters have changed in their methodology, but they're hardly over. But when the most prominent jurist on our nation's highest court wrote all of this about race and history and present day reality, I didn't question his heart and I didn't question his intellect. I knew that this antiseptic colorblind morality was well-intentioned, but it struck me as an attempt to balance our oldest and most defining social problem with the dispassionate logic one might apply to balancing a chemical equation. And it reminds one, reminded me certainly, of Baldwin's teaching, I know your countrymen do not agree, and I hear them saying you exaggerate. They do not know Harlem, and I do. And I, I, I think that what I am saying is that I wish all judges and prosecutors and legislators and teachers knew Harlem. I wish they knew West Philadelphia and the Hill District here in Pittsburgh. I wish they knew Sojourner Truth and Langston Hughes, and W.E.B. Du Bois, and August Wilson, 
and Kendrick Lamar. I wish they knew not only the words to lift every voice and sing, but why they matter. In other words, what I am saying is that I, I think it's important for John Roberts to get to know my history in as many ways and as well as I know his. Because I think that fixing our nation's severely damaged racial psyche requires that we come to know each other and to know our different life experiences far better and that we take this knowledge home with us and that we refine it and teach it to our children and apply it to everything that we do. This summer, like so many summers, is teaching us all we need to know about why this is so urgent. There are too many tragic reminders to mention in the brief time that I have to speak with you today, but as we all know, it started in May. George Floyd's murder awakened this nation to the truth of Baldwin's message. There is no redemption story here. There is just the opportunity to confront that truth. Remember, he wrote, to be committed is to be in danger. And yes, it is. It absolutely is. But this time, and despite the fear of letting go of the myth of racial superiority, it appears that many have become committed to the truth. Many more have become committed to confronting the harsh realities that have always formed the only path to freedom. In June, a lawyer from Philadelphia appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee to testify about the Justice and Policing Act. We live in the deadliest and most incarceration prone police culture in the modern world, he said. Our criminal justice system and legal system is as ravenous as it is racist. Our law enforcement community racks up thousands of civilian deaths every year, and tens of thousands more are brutalized, injured, and maimed. Millions more are arrested and jailed, making the United States the single most incarcerated nation in the world. Now, I have to tell you folks, I have worked on criminal justice reform issues since I left the federal bench, and I cannot dispute the truth of that comment. I know that if that system is to be fixed, judges and lawyers will play a key role in doing so. And some have already begun to seize that moment and to do the necessary work. In July, several judges on the Fourth Circuit, including the chief judge, took the highly unusual step of writing separate opinions in an en banc case that affirmed a district court's decision to suppress evidence illegally seized from a black man in Richmond. Each of these judges rebuked their esteemed colleague and dissenting judge, Judge Wilkinson, a distinguished federal judge whom I respect with a long record of service for his myopic view on policing in high crime communities, which is a euphemism for black communities. In Judge Wilkinson's view, police should be permitted to pursue predictive policing in black communities. Now, I traveled this country with Ben Jealous when he was with the um, Amnesty International as head of their domestic human rights program before he became president of the NAACP. And I chaired a series of national hearings on racial profiling. Predictive policing is racial profiling. There is just no way around that. And so the problem with Judge Wilkinson's view has nothing to do with his values or his intellect. He just didn't seem to understand that instead of criticizing the majority for stereotyping the police, the issue in black communities is the police stereotyping black males in particular. And as the chief judge of the Fourth Circuit wrote in response, quote, my colleague contributes to the volumes of work gifted by others who felt obliged to save minority or disadvantaged communities from themselves. In a society where some are considered dangerous, even when they're in their living rooms eating ice cream, asleep in their beds, playing in the park, standing in the pulpit of their church, bird watching, exercising in public, or walking home from a trip to the store to purchase a bag of Skittles. 
it is still within their own communities, even those deemed dispossessed or disadvantaged, where they feel most secure. Permitting unconstitutional governmental intrusions into these communities in the name of protecting them presents a false dichotomy. In August, Judge Carlton Reeves of the United States District Court for the Southern District of Mississippi issued his remarkable opinion that I commend to you all in a qualified immunity case in which he traces the history of systemic racism in our criminal justice system from Reconstruction to today. Judge Reeves, who, who I've come to know, once quoted his colleague, Reggie Walton, a federal district court judge in Washington, D.C., as saying, quote, when black judges see injustice, we have an obligation to stand up and speak out. He is right. And so it is no coincidence that the lawyer who testified about the problems with our criminal justice system to the Senate Judiciary Committee is a black lawyer, or that the chief judge of the Fourth Circuit is a black judge, or that Carlton Reeves and Reggie Walton are black judges. But black judges and lawyers should not have to shoulder the burden of addressing necessary reform while calling out racism and injustice. All judges and all lawyers should find it in themselves to offer some meaningful contribution to our national conscience by addressing the disparities that plague us and the thinking and behavior that perpetuate those disparities. Three weeks ago in my hometown of Pittsburgh, a judge was formally charged with overt and pervasive racism in cases before him. He now stands to be removed from the bench as he should be if the charges are proven. In one case, he called the lawyers uh, in, into his chambers after a defense verdict in a drug trial and he blamed the prosecutor, quote, for leaving Aunt Jemima on the jury, close quote. He was referring to a black woman who wore a scarf on her head during the trial. That same day, I learned that Jams, one of the leading arbitration providers in the country and in the world, had cut ties with a retired judge who disseminated white supremacist material to lawyers describing black people as intellectually inept socially incompatible with other races and prone to commit violent crimes for the thrill of it. Neither of these incidents would have come to light if lawyers, white lawyers in both of these occasions, had not spoken up. But these instances and so many others like them drive serious racial disparities in decisions made every day in law firms and in prosecutors' offices, in courtrooms, and on the street. And so I ask you to improve your self-awareness as I try to do first and foremost. We all need to keep doing that and we all need to keep learning from one another. We need to improve the cultures of our offices and our firms. Some of you serve on corporate boards. You might ask yourselves whether you've helped to ensure that in addition to delivering profits to shareholders, the companies you serve have a vested interest in advancing certain values. Ken Frazier is the CEO of Merck. He happens to be married to someone who was just a year behind me at Tufts, Andrea Wilkerson. And Ken Frazier once said, I really don't see a conflict between meeting the needs of shareholders and meeting the needs of society. Ken Frazier is right. Some of you might serve as general counsel. Have you considered the impact that you might have by telling your outside counsel that they need to demonstrate that they have included a person of color to be a significant part of any business that they get from your firm. Some of you are running law firms. What are you doing to improve diversity in your firms and to place more people of color in leadership positions? And in addition to these basic things, speak out. Find opportunities to speak out. Call out inequality in any form whenever you see it. This is not a liberal or a conservative issue. No one owns a corner on the marketplace of ideas of how to address this. This is a human rights issue. This is a national security issue. This should be a deeply personal issue. And this will always require a collaborative effort. I guess I would leave you with this. The, the, the nuances of race are like a web and it's easy to become trapped. 
we're all practically born into the trap. But ultimately, we will do as well as we choose to do, individually and as a profession and as a nation. And in that struggle, each of us still counts, in the words of James Weldon Johnson, as a hope that the present has brought us. As long as we continue to see ourselves in each other, there will always be reason to hope. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Judge Lewis, for those uh, impactful and powerful remarks. Um, so if we can put on gallery view, um, we will have some questions and answers at this point. Okay, there we go. So question for both of you, um, what part or impact do you think that the demonstrations that have happened this summer uh, may have on um, your research or similar research that you do, Professor Summers, and then for Judge Lewis on the legal system uh, with juries and, and uh, judges uh, evaluation or police uh, officers or prosecutors? Uh, Professor Summers? Uh, great question. I don't have, I'll give a short answer, which is we, we will see. And it's an empirical question is what we as researchers always say. I'm very interested to hear what, what Judge Lewis has to, to, to sort of speculate about here as well. It, it is an interesting time. Nothing that is happening this summer or that has happened recently is new. It has been happening for a very, very long time as Judge Lewis articulated very powerfully and very clearly. Do we have a heightened sense of awareness of these issues in, in particular white America now? It, it, perhaps it seems that we'll see how, how durable that is and we'll see how that plays out in the kinds of data I collect, but I'm curious to hear what Judge Lewis thinks about this in, in the courthouses of America. Well, uh, thank you. That is an excellent question. They're giving me hope. As someone who has observed this from many different um, angles, as I mentioned, over the course of my uh, professional career, but also over the course of my life, um, they, are, they are giving me a renewed hope. Um, I, I don't recall seeing the number of uh, white thinkers, um, practitioners, demonstrators, um, people in general uh, react in the ways that I have since um, the tragic murder of George Floyd. I think that that was possibly a pivotal moment for us if we choose to do something about it and in a sustained way going forward. Um, I have participated in more um, sessions with organizations throughout the country since then. Uh, what can we do? What should we do? And you know, I'll tell you something. Um, there, are, there are two reactions that I have to that. One, one is visceral. It is, um, why do you keep asking me what to do? I didn't create this problem. Um, I, I prefer that the people who have benefited from this issue for so many years take a good hard look at themselves and address this problem in your firms and in your businesses and so forth. That is really the wrong attitude in my judgment. The right attitude is, thank goodness that you now want to have a serious conversation about this and do something about it and are seeking some insight and some um, experience in terms of addressing, addressing some of these concerns. Uh, I, have, I have seen, for example, in, in Washington, D.C., in the U.S. Attorney's Office, just last week, I think the number is 42 or 50 assistant U.S. attorneys signed a memo that went to the United States Attorney recommending very specific changes that should happen in that office to address um, issues of diversity and inclusion, as well as uh, the prosecution of cases, because most of their cases involve Black defendants and reaching out to community organizations as prosecutors and working with them like Eric Holder was having done when he was the US attorney there. I have also seen um, judges react. I, uh, I have seen um, a report uh, by the um, um, National College of Judges, I believe it's called, that showed that 66% of judges throughout the country do think 
that racism is a serious concern within their within the criminal justice system, and they need to do a lot more to address it. I don't know that that first of all, I don't know that that survey would have happened. Um, it just happened in July, but for the events of the, uh, the earlier in the summer, and to see that recognition is important. So all of these things together do give me hope that this heightened awareness actually might be transcendent, but it's going to require each of us to continue to push this and to continue to do whatever we can to ensure that uh, criminal justice reform and all the issues that are relevant to this do not leave our radar or anyone else's. I actually have a question or response for Judge Lewis, if I may, is that okay? Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, I actually was struck by, well, many things that you said, um, Your Honor, but one of them in particular, uh, when you were talking about Chief Justice Roberts and uh, the, the, the way to end discrimination by race is to stop discriminating by race, I think it's such an important point that is worth emphasizing what that really means. And, and to me, as someone who, who studies racism and discrimination and bias, it, it betrays a, um, as you noted, a misunderstanding of what those words really mean and where they come from. Uh, the idea that it's as simple as snapping our fingers and if we're colorblind, then everything has now gone away and gotten better. And you know the Chief Justice in a way that I, I, I don't. We, our social circles don't pass, don't, don't cross. But um, th there is a way in which whether you take this phrase removed from that opinion and think about it more generally, a lot of people offer this, that isn't that the solution for our, our, our society today? And is it at times maybe naive and at times disingenuous? I think, I guess the question, it's not much of a question so far as it is just saying how I thought that was really uh, sort of captivating and important part of what you were talking about. Do you see that mentality sort of playing itself out in the legal system more generally? I know I have found that in many conversations with legal professionals, they think of, and many lay people too, but they think of racism as a very conscious, intentional act that bad people do, and that that is part of what the problem is here in some respect. I, I guess I'll, I'll turn it over to you. I just really thought that was an important part of, a very important part of what you were talking about earlier. Well, thank, thank you. I, I, I don't want to suggest that I am friends with the Chief Justice, by the way. I, we, have met, we, we, yeah, we have met a couple of times, and I, I once appeared before him in, in the uh, Supreme Court. Um, uh, but I, what I will say is that I meant, I meant what I said when I referred to him as a very, very decent person, someone uh, whom I respect a great deal. Um, and I think that he's very well intentioned in, in, in really in everything that he does. Uh, I, I, I think that that perspective is divorced from reality. And um, it is, uh, it, it fails to take into account so many things to equate the moment that he was writing about and the case that he was writing about, which he did in his opinion to the Brown versus Board of Education decision and what, what was meant there in terms of discrimination and, and, and what, what, what uh, the justices uh, were trying to redress uh, is, is just flat out wrong in my judgment. And I think that it betrays a lack of understanding of some fundamental things about the um, communities of color in this country that have struggled for so long um, with trying to get a foot in the door of equality. And so, um, I don't, I don't, it is complicated because it, what he is really saying is at one point uh, favoring, uh, if you will, one race over another is, is, is depriving someone of an opportunity. Um, and I certainly understand that. I, I, I was actually was just reading something recently. Ed Brooke was talking about this in terms of busing back in 1973. Uh, 1975, in, uh, um, uh, in an argument that he was having on the Senate floor with Joe Biden, a newly, newly minted Senator Biden at the time. So, you know, we've had this discussion, reverse discrimination and so forth. When I was on the Third Circuit, we had a, a case in which I dissented. The majority found that um, where you had uh, uh, two school teachers with exactly the same records, one white and one black, but the school district had to terminate someone. They had to scale things back. They had to make a decision. And they chose to keep the black school teacher and let the white school teacher go. The white teacher sued the school district for reverse discrimination. Um, I, I dissented the court uh, in an en banc decision, um, uh, reversed the district court and, and, and upheld her position. Um, but I, I said at the time, diversity has 
a value that is important. It has a cultural value. It has an employment value. It has all kinds of values that are important, and they should be entitled to take this into consideration. So this debate has been ongoing. What he was saying essentially was what my colleagues in the majority were saying uh, in the uh, taxman decision, which is what it was called back then. So um, we will continue to have that conversation, but at least let's have it in, in a real, in the light of day, as opposed to some um, sense of unreality. I mean, I, 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 it's not so much the decision in that case, by the way, that I disagree with, as, although I do disagree with it. It's that statement. That statement is so divorced from reality that it, it's, I, I find it indefensible. And I meant what I said when I said I wish that he would study history a little bit better. He was a history major at Harvard. He should have gone to Tufts. <laughs> Professor uh, Summers, um, have you had an occasion to meet with any um, judges uh, as, as industry groups or um, prosecutors and to go over your research um, on jury deliberations? And, and I guess if you could just expand on how many different jury groups you, you did on that. I know it's two different questions, but I'm kind of curious about that. Sure. Well, I'll take the easy one, the methodological one first. In that study, uh, we had somebody in the neighborhood of, of, of three or three and a half dozen, uh, 40 juries, mock juries in that study um, to get the, the aggregate numbers that we presented to you there. Uh, yeah, I, I have presented on this kind of research to, um, to judges and uh, continuing legal education uh, for, with attorneys. Uh, I've actually lectured at law schools uh, locally, including the University that Judge Lewis alluded to with the Inferior History Department, um, and um, it's the, the the reaction is always interesting. Um, for um, there are are those who are very open minded and who who wish to hear about this kind of research and what the real psychology of contemporary human nature is. And I don't think I need to tell people on on this call that there are pockets in which change and uh, belief change and precedent move very slowly. And there's a belief in uh, procedure. And I've had judges say to me, very interesting research. Of course, that doesn't happen in my court because during voir dire, I tell the jury, you know, no racism here, you can't be biased. Uh, and so you get sort of mixed results and mixed responses when talking about this work with uh, the legal community. Do you have any further research planned on, um, on any other aspects of the kind of the legal process? It is, yeah, it is an area that we actively in my lab study. I have a, a graduate student who, who's working with me right now who's interested in issues of uh, perceptions of uh, use of force and police civilian interactions and how those differ depending on the, the race of the civilians involved. And so um, there are, I guess, for better and for worse, no shortage of, of legal issues that I, I feel can benefit from uh, empirical investigation. Uh, to see how they, you know, what actually happened as opposed to just maybe what we accept or assume might be the human tendency in those contexts. And, and Judge Lewis, I imagine as a trial judge, um, you met with juries after they rendered their, their decision and gave the verdict. Uh, did you perceive yourself any of the subconscious biases uh, in, the, in the jury trials that you, you presided over? I, I did not in the jury trials because I was only on the trial bench for about a year or so. But what I will tell you is that the worst day, I, 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 can, I can share with you the worst day of my entire life was when I was a federal district court judge and I had to impose a, a sentence that did reflect the kind of implicit biases and, and um, uh, that, that we're talking about that create these kinds of unfair results. Um, I um, had the day before sentenced a white defendant for possession of um, cocaine to, I think, it, I think it was around three years or so, uh, uh, was the sentence it was called for by the sentencing guidelines. The next day, I had before me a black defendant who had possession of the exact same quantity of cocaine, but it was crack cocaine. And the sentence that I had to impose was a mandatory minimum of 10 years without the possibility of parole. And before I imposed that sentence, I called the uh, local news media. I told them I wanted them to be in my courtroom to watch me do something that was going to be in, completely unjust and wrong. And I had no alternative but to do it. Um, and uh, they did, and they reported on it. But it just spoke to 
what we're talking about, these, these racial disparities. That, now, that has since been addressed by Congress, but um, it, it, there are so many others that, that need to be addressed. Uh, I actually almost left the federal bench over that. I was planning to step down. I just decided this is not something I'm going to continue to do. I'd rather fight from the out, outside. But um, I was at that time being elevated to the Court of Appeals, and I thought maybe I could do something from there. So. And um, so I think we are out of our time. Um, I just want to give you both an opportunity to uh, say any sort of last remarks, uh, particularly something that the Tufts Lawyers Association and attorneys and other people in the legal profession can take away from this talk um, and, and continue on. Um, uh, Professor Summers? Oh, I'll just say a quick thank you uh, for having for having me. I mean, it's it's an, it's an honor to get to share this work and sort of connect with some of the alumni here. I, I learned a long time ago in in having conversations uh, with judges about this research one very important lesson, which is that you always give the judge the last word. And so, <laughs> you are, I thought Judge Lewis, your words were very powerful and uh, they resonated. And I really appreciated getting to be on the panel with you. Uh, and yeah, I, I will just turn things over. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. It's truly my honor. And I likewise would like to thank you, Tom, um, and Tufts for the opportunity to share a few thoughts here. Uh, all that I would say is, is keep fighting and, and keep thinking and keep feeling and keep working on advancing things in our communities. But it starts at home, but in our communities, in our offices, in our institutions, there is so much to be done before we can get to where we truly want to be and truly need to be. And, it, and it, each of us has an opportunity every day to find some way to do it. Speak out. Um, don't ever stop speaking out. Um, I mentioned what I did when I was on the bench. I, I, I had to do what, I, what, I, what the law required, but I made sure that someone was there to witness it and to report about it. That was my way of speaking out at that time. We always can find some way to address this and we have to keep doing it. It starts with ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure.